Julie Rose show today. Today I have my friend Keith on the line and my friend Eric. And we're going to go ahead and start with Keith introducing the topic today that he has chosen. How are you today, Keith? I am great. Thanks for the invitation to do a podcast with you. Thanks. Hi, Eric. Hey, how's it going? Good. Thanks for helping us with this again today. You bet. Okay, we're going to we're going to turn the time over to you, Keith, to introduce the topic for us. Okay. Julie, in your books and radio interviews, you talk about tribulations and calamities that are coming soon. And you talk about a gathering sometime after the Wasatch wake-up earthquake, but before these tribulations get really bad. Now, this concept of gathering is one that we've seen many times throughout Scripture and, and history. One of the most well-known events is the Lord gathering the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So Uh is this gathering you have seen a a physical gathering like that? Yes, it is. It's absolutely a physical gathering. I see, um, I actually see some of the gatherings beginning already, but the the main gathering that is um, kind of an impetus for change happens after, like you mentioned, the the Wasatch earthquake, which is a 6.6-7 earthquake centered in the epicenter of University of Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, that kind of sends us into the beginning of the tribulations, or what they call the days of sorrow, that's talked about in the scriptures, um, specifically in Isaiah and the book of Revelations, as well as other books of scripture. And so that gathering is a physical gathering that happens throughout the United States and throughout the world. So will this happen all at the same time, this this gathering? Will everyone be invited? Um, No, it it doesn't happen all at the same time. I do see different denominations, different states, and um, different groups and communities doing their own gatherings. One of the main gatherings I see, and it it impacts me and my family because I am of the LDS faith, is I see the LDS church gathering members of their church and, and those outside of the church that are able and willing and wanting to go to places of safety. Um, and that has been prophesied in books of scripture and um, by both modern and ancient faith prophets. And so I see that being one of the gatherings that affects many of the many of the people in the western United States and in the Intermountain area. Yeah. Like I said, I've seen some people already too that have uh, been moved upon by the, the Spirit of the Lord to to move and change their physical location. Um, mm-hmm. there, there are some of these individuals maybe that have already made a move end up in the same place that these that the large groups do? Will they end up together? Um, yes. Yes and no. I see families gathering together. I see communities gathering together. And I do see, um, like in the LDS space, I see many people going in in the LDS space, we have something called wards and stakes, as you know. And I see an, um, an initial call to gather from the, the prophet of the LDS church, who is the president of the Mormon church. And I see that invitation to gather. It's not a commandment. It's an invitation for members to gather together to find places of safety. And I see that coming from the first presidency of the church. And then it, it filters down through um, either letters and or broadcast um, to the building through satellite system where those members of the church are then gathered together. And um, and the saints have the opportunity to travel to different locations, different girls' camps, and other places that have been set up by the LDS church in preparation for the days of tribulation. Julie and Keith, do you mind if I chime in with a question for a minute? Sure, please do, Eric. Yeah, go ahead. I'm curious, you know, as you've been talking, I've been thinking about, like, the Syrian refugees and the movements going on in Europe. And I'm wondering if, okay. while it's not exactly spiritual or it doesn't seem to be, do you think, do you see that as part of a gathering? I see a lot of movement of people throughout the world as part of the gathering. It's been um, talked about in Scripture for a long time that in the last days prior to the Lord's second coming that we will be gathered together as a people 
and um, the Lord loves all of his children. So I do see gatherings taking place, people coming out from um, their locations and coming to places of safety to find refuge and um, different opportunities for people to learn about things like Christianity and also so their physical preparations are provided, their physical life is sustained, but it affects the spiritual life as well. And so it's a layered topic. Um, I see this going on also in the eternities, if you will, as the Lord is gathering his children on the other side of the veil also, preparation for the final battle um, prior to the Lord's second coming. So there, I see a lot of layers to it. It's hard to it's hard to just pinpoint one specific time or location because this is a big earth and this is a big universe. But if you're talking about the gathering in the physical sense, um, there will be movement of those coming out, like in the Middle East area. Those, um, you know, the, the children of Israel, specifically of the house of Judah, have been returning to, to Jerusalem and some of those parts of the country, or those parts of the world, for several years now, and any of anyone of their faith knows that that, that has been prophesied as well for a long time. I kind of want to just I'm, quickly I'm say that I have a friend, a dear friend, who's Lutheran, and I was asking her if their if her faith has any plans of gathering, and she says they do, and they they don't talk about it a lot, but they have food and they have a plan in place, so. It seems broader than the LDS faith, and, and um, I'm glad to hear that there are other Christians and others who are interested in this idea, too. Right. The LDS Church in particular has encouraged members of their faith to reach out in their communities and to provide um, places and food and other um, life-sustaining supplies and things like that to refugees and to help donate to refugee programs. I do know... Um, with the nonprofit organization that I started called the Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund, or GTRF, I started that in the fall of 2015. And I, um, ours is a non-denominational, um, nonprofit 501c3 nonprofit organization. And I work, it's an interfaith organization. We work with um, faith, non-faith and faith all over the country. We will end up going globally right now. We're just in the United States. And I work with the Jewish community, the Episcopalians, the Catholics, um, the, Pen the Pentecostals, the, uh, a lot of the born-agains, and a lot of the, um, the Baptists. So really just any, any group that believes in end times, believes that there is something coming to America. And there's a, a knowledge base there that varies based on the individual and the community or the parish or the, or the group. But I am finding that as I reach out to these communities, as I reach out to these organizations, whether that be Catholic Charities or other Red Cross and other 501c3, that, that um, there is a common thread there and there's a common desire, which is to save lives and give hope to those who are in need. And, and, the, and the gathering, the gathering is huge. That is the basis for my nonprofit organization is what I see going on with the gathering right now. Yeah, since you mentioned that um, that GTRF or Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund, let's mm -hmm. let's talk about that just a little bit more. So, okay. Um, uh, so, what is the mission? You mentioned it briefly, but can you go into more detail of what the mission right. of that is? Because I mean, there's other existing church organizations and other relief organizations out there. So why did you create GTRF? What, what is different about that? From well, I appreciate you asking that. That's been, um, I've had a lot of emails come in from people asking why I created this, what the purpose is, how I'm different from other organizations, or why, why would they donate to my organization. Um, the... The Spirit told me to do this. I saw this in vision um, several years ago. I woke up from my NDE and remembered that I was supposed to one day um, have warehouses of supplies, have safe houses and other things. So I've known this since 2004. I didn't know how it was going to come to fruition. I didn't quite understand 
um, and have a full picture of what it would be. And I still don't have a complete picture other than I know that um, the Lord is, is kind of connecting the dots for me as I meet more and more individuals who have their areas of specialty and have their own, um, either their own nonprofits or their own organizations, their own groups and people and individuals who have been prepared specifically to contribute to this mission. A large portion of my personal mission and therefore the mission of GTRS or the Greater Storm Relief Fund is that as we go into the tribulations and then prepare to get through the tribulations prior to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a lot of movements of individuals who will be homeless due to natural disaster or civil unrest and um, or, or to the foreign troops or what have you. And so the goal of GPRS is to save lives and to give hope. That is kind of our tagline. What I envision there is um, as I have been shown where these huge movements of people were going to go, these refugees, and where the natural disasters are or will be, as well as where the foreign troops are and where the enemy will come and where we'll be in battle and things like that, having, having been given vision of that and clear understanding of the need for where we're going to need to put supplies, we're, we're building a team. Of, we have various divisions across the regions of the United States. Again, this will end up going globally, but right now we're just starting with the United States because that's where I see the most imminent need um, as we have war coming to the United States in the coming years. And so um, being in wartime, everyone knows that, um, that it's very difficult, that, that survival becomes absolutely critical and that supplies will be limited. Um, that's just the byproduct of being in war. The 13-month war will um, create everything from um, a high mortality rate to star starvation in some cases. Going on at the same time, we will have plagues and pestilence and other things along with the natural disasters. And so in anticipation of that, I am networking with, with groups across the country to build supplies and to have safe houses and warehouses and other locations so that we can stock supplies we can have water stops, we can have food on location, we can have shoes and clothing and hygiene kits, we can have ways for transportation and things that will become absolutely critical to the survival of millions of people. So there, that, that that's sounds important. need all over the place. How will you choose where to focus your efforts or go first? Right. So I've been told and shown through the spirit where those individuals are going to be coming from and where the majority of the safe houses need to be located or the safe properties. In many cases, we, people are not going to be living in a safe house. They will be living in a tent um, as a refugee. You see that going on in Europe. You see that going on in different locations in the world when there has been a natural disaster. That is what happens in tent cities. So we're buying tents. We're stocking tents. We're buying hygiene kit supplies. We're, we're doing that. And we're looking for individuals that I can trust, that I know personally, that are willing to take take refugees in. And um, we'll de we'll be developing maps to those locations. We'll be we'll be developing. We, we have been developing um, interfaith networks to be able to communicate to help with everything from human trafficking needs to the basic survival needs of people coming through on their own with their families or as an individual. So it's a layered effort. Um, it's a very complicated thing that I'm trying to take on that the Lord has been um, putting people in my path. And it's been absolutely magnificent to work with some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. Such good hearts, such good giving people that have been specifically prepared to take part in the gathering effort. So, how does um, how does someone get involved with with that if they're interested? Um, you can go to to, to my GPRF website. You can go to my personal website, which is julierosepair.com, and on my homepage, you can scroll down and there's a link to the Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund website. That's the easiest way to do it. If people just want to Google my name and go to my website, then they don't have to necessarily remember the website for GPRF because there are there is already a counterfeit. Um, I've actually seen um, a counterfeit website that's a nonprofit that is not mine. I believe it's tied to a government entity, 
after I went public with mine that that entity showed up. And so I don't want people thinking that that's me. There have been some fake YouTubes and other things that I saw this week now that my podcasts are up. So um, just be aware that there are people that are posing as the Greater Toronto Relief Fund. Make sure if you're trying to find mine, it has a background of a mountain scene and my picture on it. Make sure that you know I only have one GPRF website, and it's greatertomorrowfunds.org. So if you want to go to www.greatertomorrowfunds.org, um, you can go to that website directly. There's a volunteer button you can click on, and there's a donate button there. If you go to the volunteer page, there's, it asks just basic information. And then we have members of our team that will get back to you. Either I will get back to you personally if I have an area specialist need, or uh, we have our, our division coordinators and our regional coordinators that are already, and our area coordinators that have already been selected. But I am still looking for quite a few volunteers um, that that can help as kind of boots on the ground to be able to make make hygiene kits and to get um, education materials, and things like that, for kids because it'll be necessary to homeschool children and things like that. Yeah, I'm. You have mentioned before some of the things that uh, volunteers might be doing in the future um, right. with GTRF, rescue missions and things like that. Are, um, are there some examples or ideas that you can you could share that what you see might be happening and um, give a better idea? Yes, I can. I see about a million people in the greater Rexburg Valley and about a million people in the San Pete Valley that is near Manti, Utah. I also see about a million people in the St. George Valley. Those are some locations that I want to put on the radar for people that um, that will be some areas that will, will kind of be considered more safe than some of the areas. There are a lot of, of places in the country that are going to be more dangerous, some that will be more safe than others. Um, I'm I'm doing a lot of concentrated effort in those areas just because I, I see the mass numbers of, of exodus and people going into those areas. But we will have safe houses throughout the country for people as they go on their journeys. As the troops come in on the coastal areas, you can imagine if you have if you have troops from a foreign army coming in and hitting everything from missiles that they're launching from the ocean or from the air, or or paratroopers coming in, or um, you know just just think about the demographics and the geography and topography of the United States. If we were at war, what the areas of vulnerability would be? Water sources will be um, tapped into. We will be dealing with um, water shortages. We will be dealing with water contamination. We'll be dealing with um, food contamination, food shortages. So being as self-reliant as possible is the first step. And second, being willing to share with your neighbor so that you can join together as a unified force to combat somebody that might come to your home that is an unfriendly force. Yeah. You, you mentioned some of these places that will be safer places. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, talking about a physical gathering, um, I, I hear people ask and say, you know, where, where is a safe place um, right. to consider? Right. So, th- those are some safe places then that uh, that people might consider. Right. Well, ultimately, I need to emphasize that the, the true safety comes through relying upon the Holy Spirit, relying upon the Lord, and getting your direction with where you need to go and what you need to do with your family. First and foremost, your relationship with the Lord is the most important thing. It doesn't matter how much food or clothing or water or other supplies you have. If your relationship with the Lord is not where it needs to be, you cannot receive divine guidance and inspiration to know where to go for safety. And that's going to be a play-by-play scenario for each individual and family because there are simply not enough growth camps, not enough church camps, not enough tent cities to be able to house everyone in the United States. And it may be that, you know, your family is meant to hunker down in a certain location to be there for someone else that might need your help. So um, in saying that, we don't want everyone fleeing to Rexford, Idaho, or to Manti, Utah, or to St. George. 
and you don't want to go prematurely. You go when the spirit guides you to go. If you feel like you're supposed to take a job somewhere, for instance, you do that. The people are being gathered all the time. There are a lot of people in the Kansas City area that have um, gathered here, and it's been because they got a job or they're going to dental school or they have another reason that they're living here that makes complete logical sense that the Lord has a higher purpose in having them here in this region at this time. Um, there are places I wouldn't go later on, but they're perfectly safe to live there now. And so I don't want to invoke fear or in any way influence someone's decision if they're not able to discern that they need to stay or go somewhere. That needs to be an individual choice that people make, relying upon prayer and scripture reading and listening to, to um, those who are in authority in the LDS church that can give counsel, um, recognizing that we don't wait to be acted upon. We take action, and we are a proactive people and a self-reliant people. And so, you know, the Lord does not command in all things, and he expects us to use our discernment, to use the gift he's given us, and to be proactive in our understanding of what he has us to do. It kind of feels, Julie, like you're saying in a way that if if you're following the Spirit and living the gospel, you're, you're in all likelihood you're probably doing what you should be doing and are where you should yes. be at this time. Right. Yeah, that's exactly how I view it. Right now, in my family, we live um, we live about an hour, 45 minutes, an hour south of Kansas City, and we live in a rural location. That's where the Lord wants me to be. And there are purposes for that with this property being a way station where we can provide for families that are going to come through when they have need. Right now, there's there's just my family and my husband has his job and I, I work. And we have, a you know, a situation that's not any more different than our neighbors on either side of us. And we go up to Kansas City all the time, and there's no problem doing that. And we lived up there for almost 11 years. This is where the Lord wants us. There are higher purposes for why he wants us here now and why he wants us here later. But there will come a time when I won't be living here, and I've seen that I will be going west to help fulfill my mission in other ways. So some people will stay in the Kansas City area, and that's exactly where they're supposed to be. Other people will be in Texas, and that's exactly where they're supposed to be. And some people will be in Pennsylvania, and that's where they're supposed to be, or different places all over the country. And that's not for me to tell somebody where they need to go. I'm just supposed to share what I know, testify and witness of God's plan, and let you know that you don't need to be afraid of anything you do as long as you have the Lord on your side. Yeah, and sometimes it seems like maybe we talk about or with other people that I talk to about this topic that um, a physical gathering is um, the focus of the discussion. But you mentioned briefly, maybe we could, talk a little bit more about the a spiritual gathering that is all that is also taking place. Um, right. wh- what does that spiritual gathering look like? Well, there's a spiritual gathering on both sides of the veil that I see going on or that I feel. Um, you know, there's a lot of anxiety in people right now on this side of the veil. And actually on the other side of the veil, there's some anxiety. You know, people, people wouldn't understand that if they don't have experiences with, with people or places or, um, Spirits on the other side of the veil, if their veil is is not um, as thin as it is for me, but um, it it's kind of physical too. The spiritual, because spirit matter is matter. It's just kind of a finer matter. It's just a different dimension. But they are preparing. They are preparing as well on the other side of the veil, and they are preparing their troops on the other side of the veil to come and help with angelic ministration and helping with the gathering and helping as we go to war. Because when we go into the tribulations, not only is it physical warfare on Earth, it is spiritual warfare like we haven't seen on the planet. And so those on the other side of the veil are preparing their troops as well to go to battle the light side against the dark side. And both sides are preparing. I see mass numbers of entities that are lining up in certain parts of the country, um, and they are preparing, they are preparing for battle on a spiritual front. And the light side is preparing, like, light years ahead um, in being able to combat the dark energy that will be upon the earth. It is all being orchestrated by God for a higher purpose, which is to bring us home to him. 
as we learn what we need to do to become more like him. And um, it's really a beautiful thing. The orchestration is absolutely fascinating to me because I don't see all of it, but every once in a while, you know, every day, some, some way or another, I get a glimpse at what's going on just with the work I'm involved in. And I think it's magnificent that through ministering angels, the Lord can accomplish so many great things. In guiding us through the Holy Spirit, he may send a relative to you that you don't even know is around you, guarding you as a ministering angel. And that relative's responsibility is to not only guard you, but to guide you. And you might have thought impressions that you need, you know, to, to run a certain errand, for instance. And while you're running that errand, you run into a friend and you have a conversation that leads to something else like a job interview or, um, you know, some kind of activity that you're supposed to be involved in in the community or something like that. The orchestration is absolutely fascinating. And and I th- I'm just continually amazed at God's tender mercies and his love and his ability to guide each of his children on the path that they need individually and collectively. Yeah, thanks. Um the idea of a physical gathering uh, takes a spiritual decision, too. I mean, the, the idea that, that the prophet invites you to leave, to physically leave, um, and it's interesting to me that, uh, that the first story in the Book of Mormon with Lehi is of him receiving a dream to gather his family and a few of his physical possessions, the only tent in his food storage, and leave most of his worldly wealth and possessions behind and leave mm-hmm. that and, um, you know, right. even gather out to a physical location. Right, and I appreciate you bringing back, that up. I mean, yeah. there's, there's a spiritual gap, too. They go back to get plates, kind of part of, part of the, the spiritual preparation and, and work that happens there. But um, that, that's interesting to me that that's, that, that that's the first story in the Book of Mormon. And it, it talks about that, and it happens over and over again. It is. But, and um, for those that are not familiar with the Book of Mormon, or in some cases those that are not as familiar with the Bible, um, in the in the Book of Mormon, that first story that is shared is read more than any other book in the Book of Mormon because people continually say they're going to read the Book of Mormon, or they um, they hear about the church and they start reading the Book of Mormon, and maybe they only get a few chapters in. But they read the story of Lehi and Nephi and Sam and Sariah and Laman and Lemuel, the family of Lehi leaving, going into the desert. And they, that, that book has been read more and more than any other book of scripture in the Book of Mormon. And that was not coincidental that the Lord designed it that way. That is not written in chronological order as far as the dates go. And so why else? You know, what's the purpose behind why the Lord would put that as the first book that he knew people would read the most? That's one of the many reasons is how important that story is. The other thing, and those that don't don't read their Bible or haven't read it as frequently or as um, more as intently as it might be helpful, um, Lehi left Jerusalem at the time that Jeremiah was the prophet. Lehi was not a prophet when he had those dreams and visions and was commanded to leave. And Lehi did try to get more people to leave. They had other friends and family. That's part of the records that have not been coming forth yet. But my understanding from what I've been shown is they did try and they left family members behind that were unwilling to go because they did not believe Lehi and they thought he was just crazy or that he was just being kind of weird that he would want to leave everything behind. And they did not go. They didn't have the faith. They didn't believe him. When he cautioned them, he warned them. At the same time, Jeremiah was warning the, the people in Jerusalem, and he was testifying and witnessing to them that if they did not repent, they would be destroyed. Jeremiah's mission was to stay with his people. They fled into the wilderness, but it was too late, and he did, he did um, he, well, they, some of them fled into the wilderness. Jeremiah actually perished um, during some of that time, and so um, he was the actual prophet of the church at the time, not Lehi. And I think that's a pattern people need to pay attention to, that um, we're being given warnings and we are being given guidance and we're being given opportunities for us to learn that things are coming 
and we need to pay attention to those. I am not the only voice out here. We've got Chad Babo and Hector Sosa and several other people that are not of the LDS faith that have had NDEs. I've had, you know, thousands, literally thousands of emails from people of individuals that live in all different parts of the, of the United States and some that live as far away as Australia and different parts of Europe and parts of Canada and South and Central America who have emailed me that have heard about my story and they have thanked me for sharing it and for the courage because they too have dreams and visions. Even if it was just one dream or one vision, they know I speak the truth and they have had an answer to their prayer that what they have been shown is actually legitimately going to happen. Yeah, and that, that is true because I've talked to many people too that have not spoken publicly or written a book that have had those same types of experiences. And I've I've heard it over and over again. Millions of people. Um, millions of people. Uh, I haven't talked to millions, but um, maybe hundreds <laughs> mm-hmm. I've talked to. Well, um, I say millions that, of people because I figure if I sold 60,000 books um, when my first book came out that first year and a half, and of that I got 6,000 emails, and those are just a small fraction of the people in the population of the world that have any idea who I am. And of the, of the 60,000 books, 6,000 emails, and probably 2,000 of those came in with people that said they'd had a dream or a vision or other, other revelation, then if you just do the math on, in the world, it's got to be in the millions, right? Yeah. Um, along with that first story that we mentioned of Lehi and Nephi in the Book of Mormon, they they and others to go with them, but not very many go. Um, right. What in and what happens uh, with this Latter Day gathering? Is the same thing happen? Yes. Do not a lot. And, of and what and what happened to those that didn't go? Those that didn't go either perished in Jerusalem or they fled to other locations and they um, they kind of relocated those. Those that didn't go with um, Lehi and his family beforehand, then when war ensued and when the tribulations during those days started, they were left to flee on foot and, and other ways that they could get out of the city before Jerusalem was destroyed as well. And so some of those, those groups broke off, but, but a large percentage of the individuals that did not heed or that those that did not listen to the prophets were destroyed and they went to the other side of the veil. So, looking forward, when there's a future invitation to gather by a prophet, and uh, what happens to those that, that decide not to go this last time? Or next well, time? I, I see everything from them going through um, torturous situations because someone gets a hold of them or their loved one, or they, they you know, die a slow death of starvation, or they um, are subjected to severe atrocities. Um, in some cases, they end up fleeing afterwards, and they make it to a place of safety. I see quite a few people that never heard of this message, um, and they they never were warned. They didn't ever hear of anything about this beforehand, and they come. I see the mass number of individuals coming in, for instance, into the greater Rexford area being people that are not of the LDS faith. They come, and they flee from other parts of the country, and they make it to the greater Rexford area. And those are the majority of those people are non-members of the LDS faith that come in and are later converted to Christ. Many of them do not even believe in Christ, but many of them will end up having their testimonies strengthened, the beginning of their testimonies, because they will be brought down to their knees, literally in humility. Yeah. And and so That's... there's always higher purposes, right? I mean, I. I right. I'm doing the best I can to spread the word and to witness and testify, especially to members of the LDS faith, who I believe have a responsibility over our brothers and sisters, as we are members of um, a congregation that covenants that we will serve and consecrate all that we have. And so that's where my voice goes to a lot of the people that I identify with and knowing some of these covenants we make. But what I see is um, it, it... it doesn't stress me out if someone doesn't believe me anymore. Um, it doesn't stress me out if somebody isn't going to 
isn't going to listen to the prophet because I see things in more of an eternal perspective. And I feel like if they, I, I believe so strongly in agency and we don't want to put, um, put our energy on someone. We don't want to, it's totally wrong to force someone to listen to a message or to try to get them to see our way in a forceful manner. We witness, we testify. I can be very bold in that, which I am and have been increasingly so, but I would never take someone's agency away. And that is totally contrary to God's plan. So my hope is that people will listen and pay attention and then take it to the Lord and do whatever he tells them and then trust that everybody gets their own answers and they're on their own path, and their own journey. And if they're supposed to go through hard things in Salt Lake City or in L.A. or in Phoenix, then I am working on trusting the Lord so much that I can give that pain in my heart that I see that they will go through and give it to the Lord completely so that I can trust that he is molding them with the individual that he knows they can become. Yeah. And one, one of the questions I had kind of ties in with this. I mean, you you created this Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund to help facilitate some of this gathering and helping and assisting these people. So uh -huh. physical supplies would be there. Um, before we talked about um, uh, donating to that fund, and you talked specifically, you talked about um, the value of the dollar and, and doing things and donating before it becomes worthless. Right. Or you lost right. the opportunity to do that. Can you right. talk about that a little bit again? Sure. So, thank you. Um, so, the dollar will collapse. Gold and silver and other commodities will be useful for a while on a bartering system. But even at that, there will come a point in time not long after the dollar collapses that none of that will even be valuable because what's going to matter is what's going to keep someone alive. And so, more of the bartering system will be going on for quite a while. And so um, we're trying to get supplies in order now with the money that we have while it's good. And I would just ask that if, if you will take this to the Lord, I, I hope that anybody who's listening to this, take this to the Lord and ask him what you need to do individually for your family. First and foremost, getting at least a two-week water supply and a two-week supply of food for your own family. And we're able and necessary getting three months of repayable goods. And then from there, if you have the money for your family, be able to get a year's supply of food like we've been counseled to do, then do that. But don't go into debt for it. There are people that have gone into debt for this, and that is not the Lord's plan. Have trace in his, trust in his plan and get a little bit as you can, because that's the counsel that's wise and that we've been given. But when you've had sufficient for your needs, then think about what you can do to stock up on supplies for somebody that might come to your own door. And then from there, if you have excess, and it will not put your family in jeopardy, and you will not be sacrificing to where it will put them in jeopardy or, or cause hurt of any kind. As you pray about it, think about donating to a relief organization, and mine might be the right one. I'm not here to um, tell anybody that mine's the right one because there are so many good causes out there, but we do want to be charitable. We want to be kind, and if you feel that this message is resonating with you, and you know and believe in my story, and you know and believe that I actually do have stewardship for GTRF and helping with the gathering as we work with other groups, then I would, I would ask you to seriously consider donating whatever amount you can. If that's $5, $5 can pay for a hygiene kit for someone. That's one more hygiene kit that we can provide. If it's, um, if it's supplies, we do have some ability to take supplies but we're asking more for people to donate funds because it's easier for us to buy things on location. You know, we don't want used underwear. We don't want used socks. Um, and there'll come a point in time where people in their communities will use that stuff. But initially, from a hygienic standpoint, we're going to be buying new socks and underwear. That's what we've been doing. Or we need to have towels and other things on hand. And I don't have the manpower nor will I, and nor have I been a certain side of spirit to, to engage people in manpower to be collecting items like a Goodwill or a DI and separating those out. We already have Goodwills and DIs. That is not the purpose of GTRA. What I'm looking at is someone donated $500. What can I do with the $500 that will be the most thing for our buck? And in most cases, 
it's that we're buying, you know, toothpaste in bulk so that when we have 50 different families come to a safe house, we have toothpaste we can give them or combs or brushes or like I said, socks and underwear or shoes and things like that. Um, and, and as far as any other used clothing, if we are getting close enough to the tribulations that if you had your children have outgrown that, those clothes, and you are in a place where you think you're going to stay and you don't anticipate relocating in the next three to five years, then, and maybe in the next two years, then I would encourage you to hang on to those so that when people come to your door, you can give a pair of shoes to a toddler or somebody that doesn't have shoes. And um, so there's so many different ways that we can help. And just thinking about what we can do proactively going into the future. As far as actually donating to GPRF, you can you can mail um, a money order. I don't want to do regular checks because that gets difficult um, when I don't know people and tax receipts and things like that. So if you do a money order or cashier's check, you save the receipt for that. That's a tax write-off on the 501c3 nonprofit. You have it written out to GPRF or the Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund. And you can send that to the P.O. Box 895, Ottawa, Kansas, O-T-T-A-W-A, -A, Kansas 66067. That's my mailing address for GTRF. You can send your donations there if it's just monetary donations. But please do not send um, supplies unless you email me first because we may want to send those to Idaho or California or Utah or something like that. And so, um, and I don't want the post office to be inundated with, you know, a box of shoes, things like that, that I don't anticipate. Um, you can also go, if you want to do a debit or credit card, you can go on to the greatersmallfunds.org, uh, to that website, and there's a donate button there, and it'll walk you through the steps. That's directly tied to the GTRF bank account that I have access to. And one of my closest friends that is on our board, we're the only people that have access, we will give you a nonprofit tax receipt that comes with that when you put the donate button so that you can get a write-off on your taxes. And I encourage people to do that if they're in a position to do that. Yeah, Julie, you know, when many people hear this story, we talk to many people, they say, boy, this sounds like a lot of doom and gloom, you know, this mm -hmm. um, gathering, leaving, uh, all these tribulations, <laughs> calamities that, that will happen. Is there anything good about this uh, gathering and future events to look forward to? Is it is it is it something besides just doom and gloom? Well, I'm glad you asked that. I love my life. I love where I live. I love my family. I love the many blessings that I have. But I do look forward to the day that the Savior will return and this dark energy on our planet will be eradicated for a time. And so that's the greater tomorrow that I see ultimately. And then, and then really on the gathering, the greater tomorrow being that we can be gathered home as beloved sons and daughters of a Father in Heaven that really loves us and he misses us and he wants us to be happy and be like him. So there are a lot of greater tomorrows. We can have a greater tomorrow today. We don't have to wait. But, um, but where we are now very much sets, sets the stage for where we'll be tomorrow and in the coming years and, and in the next generation or so. And so, um, you know, focusing on the things that make us happy that are of real value, like spending time with our friends and family that uplift us, spending time on, on meditation and other things that help us gain peace in our hearts so that we can have a greater tomorrow today so we can be ready for the really greater tomorrow and be in the right place at the right time to accomplish the Lord's design. Yeah, thanks. I, um, I know that uh, there's going to be some great things that that uh, occur in the future. Miracles, you know, rescue missions, um, service, you know, other. It it, it uh, looks like a great and and uh, enjoyable time to be here, and that the uh, the difficult times are are short and and won't last. A long time right and even even during the tribulation you know you look at the at the history of this earth when we've been at war or we've had other difficulties um, throughout all generations of time and some of the greatest heroes have arisen during those tribulations some of the greatest figures on earth that have ever been on this planet 
came about in the times that were of most difficulty. And I think we're going to see a lot of heroes that are going to rise up out of this, and they're going to they're going to be better for it. When I say heroes, I think of everyone from people who are progressing in their original progression here and on the other side of the veil, and and heroes who are saving lives and giving hope and encouragement, and in that finding rest to their soul because they are doing exactly what they were made to do, which was to find out what their true identity is and to follow the Lord. And in that, they find peace, they find satisfaction, they find help and healing and help, and they become better people because it's like they were meant to do this. They were designed, they were they were foreordained to come forth in the latter days to accomplish the Lord's designs and in so doing, accomplishing great things for their personal uh, personal growth and their healing and everything as they advance in their progression on the eternal realm. Yeah, thanks. I, I think it would be fun to to do a podcast on on some of these future miracles and things that, that are going to be happening. Some of the great that would be things fun. that are going to be that's a great idea, oh, Keith. Oh. I've I've it's heard some some stories, some examples, some other people that have had dreams that, that see the rescue missions uh, okay. that they do. Yeah, and the miracles that that occur and take place. And it's an exciting time, I think, to live and be part of. I'm looking forward to. Thank you. I appreciate that idea. I think that would be terrific to do to do some where where I could talk about some of what I see with miracles within and without the camp, within different societies, different regions of the country, different parts of the world, and then going um, on a broader scale with rescue missions. You know, as we're talking about missionary work and other things, I think it's a magnificent idea. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, is there anything else about uh, uh, a physical gathering or a spiritual gathering to add to questions? I just want to about? I just want to encourage people to study their scriptures and look at the patterns in the scriptures that are there in both the Book of Mormon and the Bible and the Doctrine and Covenants. They are there, you guys. They're there. And those that are having trouble accepting this as part of the doctrine, I want you to know, I witness and testify to you that I am speaking the truth. I'm not here to try to convince you so that I have anything to gain of my own. I am here to tell you because I know it. I've seen it. I don't just believe it, but I understand it. And I know that as you come to accept the doctrines that are in the scriptures and you come to understand the principles by which the Lord guides us, then you see those patterns more clearly and you wake up to the reality of the day that you live in and the excitement of the day that we live in. It's, a, it's both the great dreadful day that will become upon us, and I hope for everyone that's listening that you choose to make it a great day instead of a dreadful one. Um, having said that, I think it's time to wrap it up. Eric, do you have anything else to add? I have one final thought from Joel, chapter 2, verse 32. For anybody who is a little afraid of things that may be coming, it says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And I appreciate that promise from Joel, that if we just call on the Lord, we can be safe from the things that lie ahead. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. I always like it when you bring scripture in to support the conversations we've had. Thank you both of you for your time today, and I look forward to another podcast. That's all, folks. See you next time.